Welcome to Between the Covers, the show for readers and writers and lovers of books. I'm Stephanie, and I'm a publisher at Red Penguin Books, where we publish books of all types and genres. So whether you have a manuscript ready to go, a book still stuck in your head, or maybe even 200 sheets of loose paper shoved in a drawer. And yes, at least once a month, I get a package with loose leaf in it for us to type. Um, visit us at redpenguinbooks.com and unleash your inner author. I'm super excited to be joined by three authors today who have definitely unleashed themselves. Amy Bernstein is the author of the upcoming release, Wrangling the Doubt Monster, Fighting Fears and Finding Inspiration. Amy has lots of other books and I'm so glad that she tackled fear and inspiration because those are definitely things we're gonna to wanna to hear about from Amy. Sandy Modell is the author of Murder and Corruption in Florida, an unfortunate true story that you'll definitely want to hear about because it's important for us all to know what really goes on. And finally, Maureen McNeil, the author of Tinker Street, a novel, it's the second in a series. But first, we'll meet Amy. And our author writes that this is a source of hope and inspiration for anyone who worries whether they're good enough, talented enough and brave enough to take creative risks from starting a company to writing a book to opening a bakery. This timely book speaks to the doubter who lurks in all of us. It offers much needed encouragement and validation that readers will turn to again and again in a world where social media fosters so much self-criticism and competition Wrangling the Doubt Monster offers up a kind and gentle antidote to negative energy. Amy's core thesis is that self-doubt cannot be banished, but it can be managed in ways that free up the creative spirit. Well, if there's anyone who knows about freeing up the creative spirit, it is definitely Amy. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Stephanie. That was a really just terrific first rate introduction. Could not have asked for better. There we no go. Doubts, no well, doubts there. No doubts well, there. And because it's first rate because I stole your words, Amy, because you're you're such a good writer. That let me let me just take what's really good here and I'll just go with it. I, I have to ask you, with all you've written and and for our viewers who aren't familiar with you, can you give me a little peek so they know where this is all coming from before we dive right in? Absolutely. So, you know, I, ha I have written novel and I novels and I write a Substack column and I have a background as a journalist and an executive speech writer, writer and communications director and public radio, re radio reporter and all these different things. And, you know, um, I've developed quite a, a community of writers and, and book coaches around the world because I'm also a book coach working with other authors. And the kinds of things that come up in our conversations again and again, and I think probably Sandy and Maureen, if you hang out in creative circles, you hear this as well again and again, is people do worry that they're not talented enough to kind of realize their creative vision. And I really felt compelled because I hear this come up a lot, especially among women, that people should feel inspired and reassured that they can make art, whatever that art may be, despite their doubts, um, even if those doubts aren't going to go away. And so I wanted to put this piece of inspiration into the world, something that I wish perhaps someone had put into my hands um, some some years ago. Um, and I hope it's the kind of book that people can just dip in and out of and, and, and get some inspiration and encouragement on their creative journeys. Well, Amy, it's going to become the book that I'm going to be recommending to people because I, I like you, often say that everyone's biggest enemy and their their biggest obstacle is generally themselves. So <laughs> that that negative talk, we all talk to each, ourselves in a way that we would never talk to our best friend or someone else. So I love that you are, you know, going right at the heart of that. Yeah, and, and you know, my goal really is to cut across anyone who considers themselves creative in any form. I mean, while my starting point is writers in many ways, I also have friends who are artists in other disciplines. And, you know, in our culture today, um, it's very difficult sometimes to make room to take creative risks. And a, a little book like this, and it is kind of a little book, but it's meant to really help give people permission or give themselves, you know, let them 
help themselves to give themselves permission to go ahead and take those creative risks and not let doubts hold you back. And uh, because, you know, we're always looking for sort of certainty and success and, and, you know, measurable outcomes and all these kinds of things that our culture tends to be obsessed, obsessed with and to value. And, you know, making art is, is not a sure thing. And there's a lot of ups and downs that go with it. And it's hard to know whether you're on the right path. And so I want people to feel have permission to go ahead and sort of take those risks. And uh, uh, there are ways that we can manage our doubts and still and still go forward. I love that. We, we happen to have uh, an artist on the call here today. Um, Maureen McNeil is not only an author, but she's also a textile artist. And wow. as you're talking about artists in other disciplines, I, I just couldn't help but wonder, Maureen, I know writers certainly suffer with self-doubt you're in the visual arts as well. That I'm guessing that's a thing. Oh yeah, I mean both of both my interests um, started really young when I was a kid. Both writing and um, picking up my mother's scraps from her sewing, you know, a dress to wear to the to the dance club, um, and sewing them together. So I do hand sewing, big like tapestry like pieces, and um, there's a lot of. Um, similarities in the process of both writing and textile. So I call it text and textile. Oh, I like that. There's a there's a a blank space, you know, between the words, between sentences, just like there is in hand stitching. A stitch goes down under and comes back up. Mm-hmm. And you know, I've kind of taught myself that there there is no such thing as a void. There's always something under there that that needs discovering. And both in writing and in the, this process that's so ingrained in me, um, it's it's a great way to get back to my my um, roots and um, feel good about what I'm doing. And and actually, um, yeah, way of um, practicing freedom. That's kind of the way I look at it. Yep. Um, so, Amy, did this book come out of? I know you're a book coach. Were you working with so many people that had self-doubt and you said, I should write a book? Or, you know, like, how did this come about? Yes, I, I think that the core inspiration really was from talking to so many writers and people early on in their journey becoming writers and hearing those phrases again and again and again. You know, I, re- I really don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I belong here. I don't know if I can call myself a writer. I know I'm not good enough. I'm not as good as this other person. I'm not as good as you. And so, so much doubt that holds people back sometimes from even just trying. And so I just want to sort of get out there and say I'm talking to myself as well right but to talk to everybody and say go forth do it make it you know make the make make the weaving make the textile put the pieces together and you know something's going to come from nothing and you know it takes a lot of courage to do that and I think we need to give ourselves the the permission to sort of to 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 go forward and 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 do that yeah because it's it's sort of scary stuff you know when you start with nothing whether it's a blank page or a bunch of fabric scraps right you don't know what what what's what's to become of it and you want you want to it's something new to emerge it's a it's a daunting process now, Amy, I'm guessing that most of the writers you work with are people who actually wanted to be writers, but there are also those that are, I'll call them reluctant writers. And I would venture to guess we have a reluctant light writer on our call. Um, you're going you're gonna to hear more about Sandy's story, but I don't think that Sandy grew up thinking, I want to write a book. It just kind of became something that you'll hear he had to do. Um, Sandy, did you experience those kinds of doubts? Like, can I really write a book kind of a thing? And we'll talk about the situation in a moment, but I'm just talking purely process for a moment. Well, when you, had I started from a cold spot, I would have said I was a reluctant author. You took the word out of my mouth, uh, <laughs> reluctant author. And I don't consider myself an author. I'm, I'm uh, flattered to be amongst those people that truly are, but I, I am a reluctant author and, and I kind of, ended up having to do something rather than feeling the spirit. But, you know, towards Amy's thesis, I think it's great because I think it's extremely universal. I think there are very few of us that have not, and I don't really care whether it's art or teaching or business, that I think there are very few of us that have ever found themselves mid-career or that have never found themselves mid-career and suddenly being... Uh, you know, overwhelmed by what I've heard is called the imposter syndrome. And all of a sudden, 
what if they know? What if they know what I know that they should know? So I think the idea of a way to tackle the monster and um, a way to address that is something extremely universal, um, regardless of where it is. And finding the way to have the courage and the confidence to take something on, uh, I think that's a, a fairly nice solution to provide. Love that, love that. Amy, what would you say to our, we have so many perspective, and even if they're reluctant, of um, authors who watch, um, what would you say to them? Like, is there, I don't know, a five-step program or a 12-step program? <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't, that, wouldn't that make life easy? You mean uh, to say in terms of in terms of even just getting started or to keep going? Yeah. To, take, to do it. Well, so let me let me share an observation, which is that, um, and again, it sort of goes back to kind of where we are um, in our culture. We we really look for ways to succeed, to measure our success, and we look for steps that are going to get us there. And in many walks of of life, um, on the job, you know, getting a promotion, working inside a hierarchy. There's sort of, it's kind of clear what those paths may be and what, what those paths may be for us. When you are making art, when you are that so-called reluctant author, when you're embarking on something that you don't even know what that path is, you don't see what those steps are. And it's not that clear. And it's really easy to give up really early and really fast because it just looks, it looks, you know, you see this mountain off in the distance somewhere and you have no idea how to even get to, to base camp. You know, you just don't know how you're going to get there. And um, one of the things, so it's it's not only just about what I'm trying to say with this book to inspire people to keep going, but as a book coach, you know, I, I work as an accountability partner with people who might be like Sandy to say, well, let's find this path and get you on that path. And you're going to go to you're going to get to the finish line with this with this book. And it's going it's to be an amazing journey. So it really is a lot about affirmation and encouragement, it's really seeing that person and, and meeting them where they are in the beginning and helping them see that there's there's a way to move forward through all the all the scary unknowns that are out there when you're when you're making something from nothing. I, I think that you're right. It's so scary and unknown. And uh, I, I read all these statistics about, you know, 90% of the population wants to write a book, yet, you know, just a, a fraction of a percentage actually do. So something is, is happening to 89% of the population there. And I think a lot of it is is doubt. Yeah. That and it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. I don't mean to undermine it. Believe me. I don't mean to undermine it at all. And that's why, you know, people like you, Amy, who work with writers, because it's a huge bucket list item for so many people. And um, I love that you are tackling what is, you know, affecting so many people when it comes to, to doubt. Do you think that this is uh, more of a problem in, let's say, our country? Um, I remember reading a statistic that in Iceland, uh, something like 40% of the population are published authors. Now I can jokingly say it's because it's cold and dark and what else are they gonna do? But I don't know if you mentioned social media and other things that, that really make us doubt ourselves even more so. Well, you know, I think there's a lot of ways to theorize about that, but about that, but you know, we still have this ingrained um, work ethic that's that's deep in our culture, even if we pretend to kind of reject it. And it really, we, we, we are, are, we are a lot of us are brought up, not all of us, but a lot of us are brought up to basically kind of color within the lines. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you want to buy that house someday, you're going to have to find a steady job and keep at it and, you know, look for the next, look for the next job that pays even more. And so there's still a, a tremendous amount of that baked into the way we, we run our lives. And artists have a really hard time of it because oftentimes artists are working outside of that framework because art is not economically rewarding for the vast majority of people who are artists, not all, but many. So it's much harder. And so your doubts are going to live in you sort of a lot more, let's say, loudly when you're kind of outside of that normative or normalized uh, economic social framework of what the accepted path uh, looks like. So it's, it's, it's tough and we, they need all the guidance, encouragement and support that they can get. I hear you. And many artists, unfortunately, uh, are not necessarily validated by exactly. their friends, their families, the economics of this world, you know, there really are not those those pats on the back all the way up, even, you know, for, for young artists. Yeah, very true. You know, I, I was just speaking with a, an author who is an author and an artist, and I asked her a little bit about what she does, and she says, eh, 
well, you know, people call me a dabbler. I don't write. I said, excuse me? No, you're an author. You're an artist. You are the furthest thing from a dabbler. Renaissance woman, perhaps. But uh, it kind of reminded me of, of what society says to artists. And I think that artists then say it to themselves. Yeah. Over and over. Uh I was lucky because when I told my mother, like at age 12, I wanted to be a writer, she went out and find, found me a mentor, oh. you know, a college roommate who uh, got a PhD in English literature. And that lasted 20 years, that relationship. Wow. And, until she died. That, and that is amazing. It was, I, you know, it was, you know, I think you just have to learn to love the struggle of being a writer. You know, if you don't struggle, you're, you're, you're not not going to love it. You know, it's it's because making is always finding and you have to search, you know, to find your story, to work on the rewrites. You know, yeah. it's and if you don't love it, you're not going to struggle. It's it's right. really it really goes both ways. And how fortunate you were, Maureen, to get that kind of validation and be so seen and someone to support you. And yeah. I, I, I wish I wish everyone had that. That's really wonderful that you you got that. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a good story to tell because mothers out there might want to think about it when their kid comes to them. Absolutely. That. Thank you. Please yeah. shout from the rooftops. <laughs> Amy, do you think that the time for somebody to think about doubt when you're working with writers is, uh, you know, at the outset, like this might happen, let's be proactive, or once they've already like, uh, nope, nope, not going further. What? I, th I think it's ever present. And I think that it's really a question of learning to see your doubts for what they are, kind of where they're coming from. They could be also be coming from sort of like tapes that have been playing in your head your whole life. Um, you know, people, adults, other adults who didn't take you seriously, didn't believe in you, uh, teachers who maybe you weren't very good in school. And so you always felt, you know, put down in a classroom setting. I mean, there's any, any number of, of, well, there are a lot of wellsprings for our doubts, but you know, when you, when you get into a sort of an art making space, you need to, um, you need to say to yourself, um, yeah, I have doubts. I have a lot of doubts. I actually don't know if I can do this, but I'm going to let that sit there. And I'm going to go over here and I'm going to work on my thing and I'm going to try and, and hopefully I can get the support that I need. And I'm going to, I'm going to just keep going. And that's the only way it gets done. So it really is a sort of a coexistence, not always a peaceful coexistence, but there's kind of a coexistence that has to take place. I love that. Now, this book has not yet been officially released? September. Mm -hmm. September, okay. Um, has the material in this book already been in use in your work? Is that how uh, things like this go about when you actually have beta readers there, shall we say, or or guinea pigs, however you want to call them? Um, no, no, it's not really It's not really constructed that way. And that, of course, that makes perfect sense. And that would be a, a wonderful way to go. It really <laughs> is, um, it really is, it really it really is a series of um, very short essays and almost what I think of as kind of a, a, a series of prose poems, which begins to sound very sort of fluffy. But I, I will say on the book's behalf that when you start reading the material, you begin to sort of get this drumbeat of a, of a sense that's meant to sort of seep into you and help you to sort of feel a little bit calmer about the way you doubt because you're going to feel very seen when you read this book extremely seen you're going to realize because i've say some things on the paper that are already in your head or that create images i should say the book is illustrated the illustrations really help bring a lot of these concepts to life mm -hmm. and so you're going to feel almost tact tactilely felt and seen um as an, artist, as an artist who doubts <laughs> Yes, definitely. Maureen is loving that. <laughs> yeah, I, visual, you know, the world is visual and um, verbal today. So that's really a, an inspired thing to do. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Amy. And for uh, uh, if we go to amywrites.live, can we pre-order a copy there? You can, if you go to, I don't have the pre-sale link yet, but all you need to do is you'll see it's very easy to join my email list. I don't spam anybody. I give everybody a free literary gift. And that way you will, you will know when the, when the uh, pre-sale link is available. So just join my email list. That's all you have to do. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Wrangling the Doubt Monster with Amy L. Bernstein. And please go and join her email list at amywrites.live so that you can find out all about when this book is coming out. Our next book, Murder and Corruption in Florida, is unfortunately a 
big 180 turn. Sandy Modell, the author, writes, on March 20th, 2016, my unarmed son, Ryan, was shot and killed. After two separate investigations, the Lee County Sheriff's Office had determined it to be murder. The state attorney for the 20th Judicial Court, Amira Fox, refuses to file charges, but refuses to explain her decision. An Associated Press reporter remarked that in 30 plus years of reporting, this is the only time he has ever seen a state attorney unwilling or unable to explain a charging decision. Former prosecutors, countless legal experts, a former state attorney and a myriad of experienced journalists have reviewed the case and all they see is a murder. Amira Fox is the only one who doesn't see a crime. The story that follows is the explanation for the corruption and self-dealing behind that decision. It is a hard story for the father of a homicide victim to write, but I believe it's the path to justice for Ryan. Please welcome Sandy Modell. Thank you for joining us. Again, thank you for having me. Um, and I realize this takes a slightly dark turn. I was kind of thinking as you wrapped up that most of us need a book like the one that Amy's written, unless we're fortunate enough to have had a mother like Maureen, mm -hmm. a, uh, a visionary. Uh, you imagine having a mentor at that age. So it's very fortunate. Um, I am a reluctant author. Um, my industry was finance and um, I did retire early and became an adjunct professor uh, at one of the largest schools in the country. Largest, largest, not one of the best, but they are the largest. <laughs> and they sometimes confuse quality and quantity. And so I'm not an author, but um, the crime is murder. Uh, everyone that sees it universally understands that. And I've tried a number of things over years, over the years, <clears throat> to get the case attention. I've talked to politicians, I've talked to journalists, I've put up billboards, I've done podcasts, number of things, and I started running low on ideas. My attorneys suggested back, oh gosh, probably in 2021, early 21, that I write a book about it. And uh, you know, as real authors like Amy, Maureen, yourself, and others know, it's a daunting task. It's not something I wanted to do. It's not something I thought would be uh, pleasant. It wasn't a topic that I really wanted to cover, <clears throat> but it seemed to be the, the, the next step on the path. And so I set about writing a book as a rank amateur and with more of a mechanical process than soul or spirit. I just really kind of said, where do I want to start? And who are the players along the way? And where does it end? And so that was the framework I started with. And I spent close to a year putting meat on those bones. The book was well-researched because I think that's the first place you start. Do your homework. Rather than being accused of just being a ranting, grieving parent, I want to make sure it's factual. So the book was heavily researched, well-researched, and well-sourced. And I think one of the things I'm proudest of is that in the book, I name six current or former elected officials in Florida that I think have engaged in some level of inappropriate all the way up to corrupt behavior. And after about 15 months on the market, not one has filed suit. In fact, I haven't even gotten a threatening phone call or a threatening letter from somebody's attorney. I believe that's tantamount to an agreement that what I've written is the truth. So what I've looked to do is use the book to get publicity for my son's case. I am not in the book selling business. <laughs> I'm the uh, attention for my son's case business. Yeah. Uh, so there will not be sequels. I don't anticipate doing this. <laughs> no matter how much motivation Amy can provide or <laughs> even with uh, if Maureen's mother gives me a call. Um, <laughs> it's just not a direction I think I'd go in. But it's been important, um, not nearly as cathartic as you would think or hope. Mm -hmm. It was just a task that needed to be accomplished to raise the raise the uh, awareness and raise consciousness for my son's case. And so right. um, that's what I've done. 
and um, it's been well received. It is not uh, making John Grisham worry yet. I don't believe he's concerned. So <laughs> it has not gotten huge acceptance. I've I've done my best with it, yes. and, but it's clearly uh, an amateur's approach to making sure. I just told the story. Well, certainly, meant very different book than than others. But I think all of us here agree in the power of books, the power of writing for a, a myriad of reasons. And, and, that's, and that's definitely power right there. And I'm so Well, most of us are, I'm sorry. Most of us are parents. And at its core, this is a story about losing a child. And that's, a, that's all of our worst nightmare. And uh, I just happened to draw the short straw on a very stupid series of events um, and then subsequently, I've dealt with um, self-absorbed politicians who are more interested in campaigning for the next job rather than doing their current job. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it in several places. And that's what I talk about in the book. Well, you're certainly going to inspire other people in your situation to investigate and do the research and maybe write a book. But I, I think it I think it's really admirable. It's, I know it must have been really hard to do. I can't. Even I think you know exactly how it feels. Most people do. Yeah. It's not as yeah. though unless you experience it, you couldn't possibly understand. No, we all get the idea. Um, yeah. What has happened is I've been approached by groups that have, uh, there are a lot of groups for grieving parents, is, families of uh, violent crime victims. And I've uh, accepted and joined probably four of them. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's actually a tough thing to read because the, the feeds come through and um, it's just painful to read it. You realize very quickly, you're not the only one in the boat. Mm -hmm. um, the only advantage is as you're at it longer, you get a little experience on things to do and things to avoid, friends, social contacts, how the topic is handled. So when someone is newer to it and they post up difficulties they're having, uh, from time to time, you offer a little guidance I do it sparingly, but only if I think I have something very much on point. You know, I just want to add, I, I, you know, as we said earlier, and as we know, I mean, writing a book is hard enough to write a book for the reasons and based on the material that you did to me is un un unimaginable. So I think it's, it's you've shown just extraordinary grace and grit to get that done. And I, I want to hope that you're pl you've planted some seeds that might lead to some justice somehow somewhere someday you've done everything you can it sounds like to that end and 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 maybe maybe the book is is going to plant seeds in in places you don't even know i mean i'm just I'm looking for you know something constructive in all that which i which i think is probably part of what you must i imagine you you hope for as, as well but so difficult so 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 difficult well thank you amy I'm, it's it, it's it was difficult um but I think uh, I think humans have an amazing capacity to do a lot of things they never expected to do until they find themselves having to do them. Uh -huh. And so, um, you know, I did grad work uh, years ago, and uh, one of the programs included uh, the discussion of heroes. And are they extraordinary people or are they just normal people under extraordinary circumstances? And so it, I think we all have the ability to do unpleasant things if we have to. And in this case, I felt I had to, I felt compelled to do it. And, um, and I'm hoping that it, that it strikes, uh, strikes chords with other people and, and, uh, and does catch uh, the kind of attention that it needs to. At least that's what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. I, I say a huge kudos to your lawyer for suggesting it. Uh, I've worked with a number of authors who have written books in a vein of trying to get more attention, whether it's on a case or something. And um, while there's certainly no surefire method out there, it does put you into circles that you weren't in before. For example, now you're on the author circuit, let's say, whereas before the book, you were, you know, maybe with the grieving parents, but not on the author circuit. And it just kind of opens up more windows. So that, as Maureen said, hopefully more people more voters, more people who are hearing about this case and understanding the impact that it's having. And, and you've presented it with all the, the, the facts right there. They don't have to sit around and, and do their own research. So 
I think that your your lawyer was wise to suggest it and and you are amazingly brave and resilient to take up that charge. Well, thank you. I think we would all do it under the circumstances. I just, I happen to be uh, misfortunate enough to have those circumstances. He actually urged me to do it. He's a nationally known attorney and a national ex expert on stand your ground, which is what the state attorney tried to allege. He just didn't qualify. And no expert that's ever seen it thought it was stand your ground. Um, there are a number of elements that stand your, that remove stand your ground as an acceptable defense, and this removes them all. So it wasn't. But he urged me somewhere around the summer of, I think it was 21. And it was not until well into 22 that I finally, I mean, I wrestled with it quite for some time. And it would have been helpful if I'd read Amy's book first, because there was some imposter syndrome, uh, thinking, can I really pull this off? And, uh, you know, can I do it and have it look like a book rather than something that a, a grieving victim's parents uh, cobbled together? So um, it took me about eight, nine months before I actually finally stopped griping and just went and did it. Fantastic. Fantastic. And for any of our viewers out there, uh, I just want to also make sure that they saw your website, justiceforryan.com. Uh, the book, the website, learn more about this case. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm guessing that with the book and all, that's probably one of your primary objectives, isn't it? Get people to know the facts, especially Absolutely. who, you know, might have any pull whatsoever. And it sounds like you have been, you know, knocking on every door and pulling every string there is out there already. I've, tr I've tried. I certainly have. Uh, the book is on Amazon and it's priced just about as low as they'll allow me. There's a big chunk for printing and then there's a, a percentage. So it's not priced uh to make money, right. it's dangerously co close to a break even. And I'm fine with that. Yeah. There was never an interest in my part on making money at this. So uh, it is on Amazon, uh, both um, both in a paperback as well as a um, an ebook. And there is, if I can shamelessly shill this, there is an, a change.org petition mm -hmm. uh, to, support, um, to support my efforts to get the government to move the case to an honest district. And that's on change.org, just Ryan Modell. So uh, my hope is that people will read the book or see the website or hear this kind of a show and sign the, uh, sign the petition and maybe send a letter to somebody and provide some support. That's really the, uh, the overall goal. Yeah, and, and, and not a huge ask. You're asking for the case to be moved to another district where a fair trial can be heard. That's correct. You know, that's that's the ask. That's, you know, that's who, who doesn't want that, you know? <laughs> well, there are two people that don't want it. One is the, I believe, corrupt state attorney in the 20th district of Southwest Florida and the governor. And he's ignored five years worth of petitions. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of other avenues to pursue, but, um, in the eight years I've been working on this, I've never heard anybody else call it anything but murder. And all I'm saying is it should have a trial. And if it turns out this guy is acquitted, well, then I'd have to accept that. Mm -hmm. And if it turns out that uh, he's indicted and then charged or indicted, charged and convicted of murder, tried and convicted, then everybody should feel that justice was served. There shouldn't be anybody opposing this other than fellow murderers, I guess. Right, right. That's why I said your your ask is not even for that end result. It's for a trial. I believe, based on the evidence, uh, we have civil depositions that form the basis of a second investigation done by the police. I believe, based on the evidence, it will be a significantly easier to get a quick trial and a conviction than it has been to get an indictment. And that's a ridiculous statement, but it's accurate. Interesting. Interesting. I'm sure that at the end of this, you have learned more about the legal system than you ever really wanted to. If you wanted to come out of retirement from finance and go into, you know, getting your JD or something, you're probably right there on the cusp of qualifying. I don't know. Well, first of all, I don't. Um, I'm but, sure you don't. <laughs> but and, and there'll be no high fiving moment. No, uh, they move the case and the um, uh, they choose to indict, try and convict and imprison the murderer. There's no high five because my son doesn't come home. So this never gets good. Um, but the 
the real essence of this is not the law so much as politics because the law is pretty clear. And I've met with former prosecutors, a former state attorney, which is a, a New York district attorney for different counties or districts. And I've met with all of them and it's not the law. It's the politics. And that's the unfortunate part. Oh, as a person who firmly admits that I really don't understand what one thing has to do with another law and the politics. I, I would agree with you. And I've come to find out it has everything to do with it. And that's the unfortunate part. So unfortunate. Well, yeah. certainly we want to share with all of our viewers uh, your book, Murder and Corruption in Florida by Sandy Modell, but justiceforryan.com. Visit, sign the petition simply to have the trial, you know, the, the case moved so that an actual fair trial can come, um, but justiceforryan.com and read up on it yourself. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Our third author today, Maureen McNeil, who you met as an author and an artist, and is the author of Tinker Street, which is a prequel to her novel, Anna Magdalena, which came out in 2022. Our author writes, struck by love for a boy as beautiful as a Michelangelo, 15 year old Maggie digs her heels in She's got what Willa Cather called luck making power of desire. She's a rebel in the best sense of the world. Growing up in Woodstock of the 1990s, the daring performance artist Anna Magdalena is called Maggie. Raised as a love child in a communal household in the magic of the Catskills, her mother refuses to reveal her father's name. Hoping to coax him into plain sight, she performs scenes from King Lear on the town green and exhibits her miniature portraits of townsfolk at the Woodstock Library. Strangers approach with details of her birth, claiming her as their own, but she's no fool. Artists, she calls fairy godmothers, rally around. On her way to New York City, Dylan's man in the long black coat appears and the whole wide adult world opens up. You will definitely want to join author Maureen McNeil on this fantastical journey of Tinker Street, the prequel to her novel, Anna Magdalena. Thanks so much for joining me. Oh, it's so much fun. Thank you for <laughs> having me. Um, I have to start with Anna Magdalena because um, she's a performance artist and I never could have written that if I hadn't written a book about Marilyn Monroe. Uh, I was the executive director, not the executive director, the, the administrative director of the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute for many years and got to know Marilyn uh, and ended up writing her, uh, a fictional diary of her last, um, her last seven months just to find an emotional truth about her story. Um, because, you know, I, I needed to separate Marilyn the human from Marilyn the icon mm. and, and figure out how you, an icon is made. But anyway, from that, I was able to write about my own performance artist. Um, it started as a short story. I was at an NYU writer's workshop and somebody said, you know, it should, I would like to see what happens to Reedy Bordeaux with, if he moved to New York. And I just thought, okay, cause it was a West Coast story. I said, wow, how fun would that be? <laughs> and so, he fell in love with it. He's a plumber, a married plumber who falls in love with this performance artist and ends up in the New York City art world. So um, so then I got this wonderful three book contract. <laughs> I, I, I suddenly I had I've lived in wonderful towns my whole life. Uh, you know, Olympia, Washington, you know, home of grunge music, Red Hook, Brooklyn, you know, the most interesting dilapidated neighborhood back then in the 80s um, and Woodstock, New York uh, for 20 years. We had a house there and for three years moved there and I taught writing at the Woodstock Children's Center. And so immediately I wanted Anna Magdalena, I call Maggie, to grow up in Woodstock, which is a magical place. The mountains, the light are magical. The um, everything from Washington Irving's um, Rip Van Winkle story, you know, to the Woodstock Festival, 
there's so much love and there's it's so child centered um and i'm i'm really interested in utopias anyway but um so it was a fun book to write and i think it's a fun book to read hopefully um and uh maureen i love that you said you're interested in utopias because mm -hmm. you you build utopias and I just love that. I never heard you say that before. And now that you've said it, I can't, cannot forget it. Well, just wait for uh, the third book of the trilogy. <laughs> I should I'm not sure that. if it's gonna end up as a utopia or a dystopia at this oh, point. Okay. <laughs> uh, Enjoy that utopia while I'm there. But you know, <laughs> your, your writing and your, and your textile art and your, and your life and the places that you have uh, made intentional choices to live, you are all about building utopias. And I, yeah, love, thank I you. love the I, intentionality with which you live your life. Thank you. I, you know, uh, during college, I opened up a, a restaurant, a collective restaurant uh, with a girlfriend. And um, it turned out, it was actually my first novel. And it turned out to be kind of a war between the sexes because it was, two women and five men and uh and i you know i was sewing and i was writing and i was cooking and i and when i left there i became a welder in my uncle's factory because i felt like i had to do something not conventional you know not gender specific and um it i left feeling like i could do anything after mm -hmm. that and um so I do look for experiences because I kind of believe in Buckminster Fuller's way of um, answer, asking and answering, answering questions. You know, he, he wants, he asks a question in the morning and he wants to answer it by the evening, but only through his own experience. So that's why I, I have these characters who are willing to do things. <laughs> um, unconventional and, uh, so, so uh, Maggie's mom is, you know, a feminist single mom and Maggie's quest is to find out who her father is. And she thinks he's hiding in plain sight. So she, she performs on the town green and she, she paints these, you know, portraits of the community people and has an exhibit in the library, all trying to lure him in. And uh, so that's a, part, a fun part of the story because we all want to know who we are. Absolutely. We are. Now, with all these utopias that you build, you talked about Marilyn, but you were very involved with another very famous woman. Yes. So that's Anne Frank, <laughs> the Anne Frank Center. I, I created programs, uh, art and theater and writing programs for uh, New York City students and U.S. prisoners. And I had a prison diary writing project with that I partnered with Pen America. And it was very profound uh, after, and then these, these prisoners, I never met them. I would send them a copy of her diary. They would read it and, and then write their own and send it to me with permission to publish. And um, I, I couldn't speak after I, first, I read the first one. I couldn't speak for a week. Um, but then I, you know, um, I, 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 got, I, I learned, I learned from it. And a lot of them had never told their story to anyone. And they were so amazed to have an audience, even if it's one person, to listen to them. And uh, Anne Frank taught me to write. She has this whole uh, arc of self-discovery, you know? And so it, it was, I've used that so many times and it's, it's all about, um, you know, her self-discovery. Um, and uh, I believe in diary writing. I believe in writing every day. Um, and it just gets easier and better. And George Saunders, his way of editing is, is so powerful. You know, where every time you come back to the story, you, you come at it from a different angle, a, a different freshness, a different mood, a different emotion. And so you just keep, it's like clay. You keep putting your fingerprints around it. And pretty soon you have a vessel, you have something. I, I see you have a fan here, Amy, in the uh, in, in the, the Sonder editing method here. 
Yeah. Yes. Well, he's he's incredible. And um, I have a question for you, um, Maureen. First, I want to say that I think the cover is just stunning. Oh, the cover you. is so beautiful. It's yeah. so arresting. I kind of couldn't keep my eyes off it. Yeah. So that's that's just yeah. wonderful. It's a yeah, it's a great cover by um, Sergio Pertel, who's um, a Chilean photographer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's it, a great choice. Yeah. Thank you. My question is this, and I'm I'm this is my book coach brain because I'm so intrigued. Writing a prequel to me is like like reverse engineering a novel. In a way, it's like <laughs> you take you take the the book you wrote first, and then you turn everybody's backstory into the main story. In a way, and so did you? I I'm I'm guessing, and I may totally be wrong. I'm guessing you didn't you didn't go you didn't set out to write book one and then set out book write the prequel but that's but that's what evolved i mean that's just a really interesting fascinating process of going to the before as opposed to the after right and i actually even did that with the first chapter of anna magdalena um you know it starts kind of in the present and then the second chapter th and third and fourth chapter are the back stories to it and then i go back to the you know, so I, I believe that time, I really believe in Einstein's time that, you know, present, past and future are all kind of one. So, you know, but I know the reader needs to know where they are in space and time. So hopefully that can happen. And some people might want to read this first. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I didn't I didn't write it that way, but I think it could be read that way. And that's OK. Well, I think I think oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just think the idea, I mean, aside from the common elements of creativity, I think the idea of writing and the idea of textile art and art in general, I think they're so different that to meld them together and um, as a combination is um, it's just very impressive. It, it's, it really alters the way I would see th something or perceive something. And I like Amy's description of it because I've used this before in other things. Uh, I used to do a lot of public speaking and sometimes um, you would back into something. You would start off with where you had to end up and work your way backwards. But I, I, I think the idea of discuss, discussing a prequel as a reverse engineering process is just so spot on. So it's, it's, those are two things, reverse engineering it and then that combination makes it quite unique, or at least to me it does. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I think that... Um... You know, I, I wrote the first draft in six months. I just sat down and wrote it. And, you know, of course, there was a lot of rewriting. But, sure. um, but I when you when you know your character so well, it actually and then, you know, the place, the setting of it, it, it was it was just really fun to write. Really fun. I can imagine it would be the premise. To, it sounds like it would be. Uh, of course, there's this great falling in love. She she's never going to love anybody the way she loves her first love. <laughs> so it's so profound. It's it just was so much fun to write. Um, is it is it YA, Maureen? Is it young adult or is it adult fiction with young protagonists? It's adult fiction. You know, she moves to New York City after that. So right. got it. <laughs> it has to be. Yeah. And, yeah. and and book two written as book one is definitely not YA. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yeah, book two is not. I mean, book one is not. You yes. neither of them. <laughs> Absolutely. But I, I love that that thought of of writing. I, I think of the Star Wars movies, you know, they didn't realize when we were all watching the first Star Wars movies that we were actually watching movie number four. <laughs> uh-huh. You yeah. know, so I think that could could happen with a book, and that's so exciting. Uh, Maureen, is is book three after book two or before? <laughs> it's after book one. Okay. It's after book one. Okay, <laughs> just so I know what to gear up for. In the yeah, book. yeah, it's it's um it's coming. It's I love that. You know. I love that. I have to ask you because you've had these unbelievable experiences. Um, heading up huge centers with um, two incredibly different women. Uh, uh, is there another woman, uh, you know, another woman in my life that, that you would like to have that kind of 
you know, executive director of their, their, you know, is there somebody else? I mean, from Marilyn to Anne Frank is just so uh, dichotomous. I'm wondering if you could pick your next, you know, Maureen McNeil wants to get a phone call from the center. Oh, or, oh my God. Or, who is it going to be? Cleopatra? Oh. I don't even know. Well, I think Lu Louise Bourgeois is really cool. Um, mm -hmm. She actually ended up doing a lot of cloth sculptures at the end of her life. And I've made a lot of cloth books and I've actually made cloth sculptures of my characters, um, you know, like about this big, just their busts. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there's so many great women out there. Um, Is Is Adora, Is Adora Duncan? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. She, yeah. her quote, like, it's none of your business what other people think of you. Mm. That is so powerful because you've got to, you know, as a writer, you have to ignore the world so much, so much of the world in order to write that um, I think that she's amazing. And my cousin, uh, my dad's cousin, I, I lived with in West Beth when I first came to New York um, and she had her own dance company and um and she had studied with Martha Graham. So I have a lot of like Martha Graham in my head too. Um, but, you know, I thought liberated women, you know, really appeared in the 70s, 60s and 70s when I was growing up. And the more I read, the more I know they are throughout history. Throughout history. Always somebody. They might only be remembered in a myth, you know, or something like that. But um but there are a lot of interesting, and I, 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 as a writer, I really get a lot of confidence and I, I feel like uh, artists and writers and thinkers living in debt are really my community because they support me in their words, you know? And uh, it, it gives me a whole community to reach out to when I'm in doubt. <laughs> And, and I think that Isadora Duncan quote is going to make it into, you know, Amy's next book. As well. oh, I, I wrote it down. It, I saw you write it, it'll down. Make it in, it'll make it into my Substack newsletter, Doubt Monster. <laughs> it's probably what's go. going to yeah. happen. <laughs> that, yeah. that is definitely getting used for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a huge one about manifestation, Maureen, as you know. So, so that's why I asked you if there was another woman out there. Put it out there in the universe. I haven't really thought of who my favorite favorite next one would be. But Marilyn and, and um, Anne Frank actually had a little crossing because- Really? Besides Marilyn, <laughs> yeah, I, we don't really have time to go into it, but, um, but anyway, <laughs> Mar Marilyn looked to Anne Frank and the play was being on, on Broadway when she was living in New York and she was living with the Strasburgs and Susan Strasberg was playing Anne Frank. Wow. So there's a lot of, cross right Look there that. and I thought the only thing they crossed on was Maureen McNeil yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well. well what what a delight this has been before we break just uh, a question for all of you because you are so inspiring you've come to this from so many different viewpoints um, a word of encouragement a tip you might say for our future writers out there whether they are deliberate or reluctant writers. Amy, what would you say to our viewers who are writers? You need to know when to listen to the universe and when to tune the universe out. Mm -hmm. And you, you are going to be your own best source of encouragement. And you need to listen to that voice in you that's really clamoring, sort of, you know, help you become who you want to become. And you have to not listen to the negativity that is out there all around us every single day, because it's not your friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I get that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sandy, the reluctant writer. <laughs> Very reluctant. I think uh, I think the only thing I would offer is that either passion or commitment mm -hmm. that a passion or commitment that you feel uh, will drive you and you can answer it now or later or maybe beyond that. But the bottom line is you're going to have to face it, address it, and complete it. Or living with the, the consequences can be uh, can be very, very challenging. So I think really, when there's something important enough to you to write about, whether it's a, a childhood experience, a uh, company you've built, in my case, a loss that you may have suffered, whatever it is, 
if it's a true passion and you're truly committed about it, it's a call you have to answer. Thank you. Even even if you do have an imposter syndrome that would have been fixed if I'd read Amy's book first. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, Maureen. Um, yeah, I just want to say, Sandy, I'm so moved by your story. I'm going to be thinking about it for a long time and I'll, I'll have to read the book. Um, but um, I think that no matter what you're writing, if it's fiction, if it's poetry, if it's nonfiction, I think that the writers I like best the, you know, uh, all have something to offer about making the world a better place. Mm. And, you know, social justice is really important and right. Creators get to create the world, you know, and you want to have some hope in there. You want to have, uh, you want to change it enough so that the next generation coming through, you know, agrees because culture is always changing and it has to. And so your, your creative work, has to be different from what the world says today. True. Love that. Love that. Mm -hmm. And let me just remind all of our uh, listeners and viewers um, about our wonderful books here. Amy Bernstein is the author of Wrangling the Doubt Monster, Fighting Fears and Finding Inspiration. Sandy Modell is the author of Murder and Corruption in Florida. And Maureen McNeil, the author of Tinker Street, the prequel to Anna Magdalena. I can't thank the three of you enough for joining us. And uh, for all of our viewers, you have a lot of reading to catch up on now. So thanks so much. Thank, thank you, Pat. Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Really fun. Wonderful.